Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to start by expressing my appreciation to the pastoral team and the health ministries department at the New Life SDA Church for inviting me to speak on their day. Secondly, I want to state that uh, uh, I want to pay tribute to my mentor and friend, the late pastor Helvius Thompson, who was our camp meeting speaker in the year 2007. He passed on last September, and I want to say that uh, this presentation will be dedicated to him. He was my pastor at uh, Ephesus SD Church in New Orleans, and uh, he taught me a lot, and he gave me a lot of sermons that he wanted me to preach. One of the sermons that was preached at his funeral is the one that he himself wrote. Thirdly, I want to give a disclaimer that I'm not a theologian, but if I were one, I would be a Paulinian theologian since I find the epistles of Paul speaking to me in a very special and deep way. The book of Revelation is uh, where the text was read from is a favorite followed by the writings of Dr. Luke. And Elijah is my all-time favorite prophet. You know, like prescriptions, this uh, presentation could have been made in your presence. But in medications and prescriptions, there's always room for repeat prescriptions or refilling of prescriptions, especially for long-term conditions. There's also room for discussions on prescribed medications, especially if the patients are not adhering to the medications. You know, the current coronavirus pandemic, whose genesis is attributed to perverted dietary habits, compels me to issue this prescription again. So the outline of my presentation, I will make a brief introduction on the book of Revelation from where our main text was derived and I will give you what I think, in my view, is a message from the book of Revelation. Secondly, I'll give you the biblical basis of the health prescription. And if I were a researcher, I would call it literature review, but in a seminar, I'll call it climate setting. Then I will give the three uh, prescriptions and make a call for action. But before I say anything, uh, allow me to introduce my two nieces who visited us here. They are not members of this church, but they have come. Uh, Maureen, just stand and wave. And Cindy, I don't know where you are sitting. She doesn't come here, but uh, I invited her and she came. I'll invite Kasme to come and uh, lead us in a chorus. Kasme. Lord, come down. 
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, the time has come when your word has been to be spoken. Let it be spoken boldly, and may we understand. Speak to us in a special way, because I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of, uh, the last book uh, in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, was written by John, probably the apostle. It was written toward the end of the first century. Those specific interpretations of this book probably vary widely. Most will agree that John was reporting God-given visions of intense conflicts, conflict between Christ and his enemies. He assured his readers, John, that Christ was in control and that in the end, victory belonged to Jesus Christ. Those enemies of Christ would experience devastating judgment. In writing this book, John's ultimate goal was to inspire hope in his readers in the midst of suffering they were experiencing. So this book is relevant to us today. And I suggest that there are four important messages for us today in this book. The first message from the book of Revelation is that even though evil runs rampant in our world, there's a strong reassurance in the fact that Christ is in control and for the final victory belongs to Jesus Christ. You know, we talk about, we have in an electioneering period in this country, people are talking about I'll fight corruption, I'll do this, I'll do this. Let me tell you, there's no human being who can get rid of corruption. No human being. The person, if you read, the person who will get rid of corruption is Jesus Christ himself. John looked in, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 2, he says, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open the scroll and even look it inside it. Then one of the uh, elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Only Jesus Christ will be victorious over sin. It is only Jesus who can talk the heart of man. The second lesson is that under no circumstances should we compromise our Christian commitment and principle, though the pressure of the moment may tempt us to do so. The third message is that we ought never to forget that eternal judgment is in store for those who oppose Christ and his word. Finally, someday, brothers and sisters, someday, we will be part of that heavenly throne that will praise God forever. Amen? So in 14, uh, the Revelation 14, verse 7, John writes, Fear God and give glory to him. One of the ways that we can give God glory to God is by maintaining our health and taking care of our bodies. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, the Apostle Paul writes, Wherefore, there, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it for the glory of God. We give glory to God by how we eat and how we drink and how we follow the guidelines of health. In spite of the medical advances, that have prolonged human life, I want to tell you that more than eight people, more than one in eight people, about 10%, will be a hospital patient this year. And in the US, there are more than 80,000 Americans who have chronic illness to, one or greater, to a lesser or a greater degree. But this is a paradox, ladies and gentlemen. 
We live in an age where there are more doctors, more hospitals, more pills, more medical knowledge than has ever been before. And yet there has never been a time of sickness and ill health than today. Just to tell you, give you an example, 25 tons of aspirin are swallowed every day in America. That is about two and a half tablets per day for every man, woman, and child. Though people fear sickness above all enemies, yet they, they, they mostly, most of them do nothing to preserve their health until, until sickness and disease has already struck. For many of them, their appetite, their diet, and their lifestyles are their own worst enemies. Millions of people are suffering from the side effects of harmful eating and drinking. Harmful eating and drinking is the trademark of our time. Do you, do you know that 75% of diseases in this world are preventable? And the number might even be higher. There are diseases that people do not need to suffer from. There's never been a time than ever before when people with full knowledge of what they are doing have followed a path of self-destruction. We know what to do, but we are following a path of self-destruction. All of us have to face the issue of health and preservation of health. All of us. Many have neglected their health, and therefore they will never reach the ripe old age. And there are many people who have already died prematurely because of neglecting their health. There are people who should be alive today, but because they have neglected their health, they are pushing up days in some graves. I want to tell you that the Bible has much to tell us about our bodies and what God expects us to do with regard to our health. There are many people who believe that it does not matter what you do about your body and what kind of health you are in. They say that what, when your time comes, that is it. It does not matter what kind of shape you are in, that you cannot live longer than your time, and that you certainly you cannot die before your time. And therefore, you might as well enjoy your time. The Bible says there's a general time limit in this world. In the book of Psalms 90 verse 10, the Bible is written that the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they might be 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. This text, brothers and sisters, reveals that the average human lifespan today is 70 years. And if we are in good shape, we can make it to 80 or more. However, the Bible also declares that it is possible to die before your time. The Bible also says that it is possible to live longer before your time. What does the Bible say about this? The book of Proverbs 10 verse 27, we read, The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. I want to let you know that it is possible to live longer than your time. But it is also possible to shorten your life. The Bible declares that if you fear the Lord and obey his word, that your days on earth will be prolonged. And if we are wicked and follow the wickedness of the world, the Bible says that the days of the wicked will be shortened. You know, the Bible gives examples of people who live longer than their time. And the Bible also gives examples of people who died before their time. One of the people who have lived longer than his time is Enoch. Enoch is in heaven. Enoch is in heaven. The, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God and God translated him to heaven without dying. Enoch is eating from the tree of, of life today in heaven. The Bible also tells me that Elijah is alive today because the Bible says those, the Lord 
the fear of the Lord prolongeth days. Elijah was translated by chariot of fire, and Elijah is in heaven and is alive today. The Bible also talks in the, the about uh, in, in the book of Isaiah a king named Hezekiah. The, pref, the prophet came to he to Hezekiah and told him to put his house in order because he was going to die. He cried to the Lord, turned his face to the wall, and God sent the prophet back and, and told him their prayers have been answered and these days were prolonged. What I'm saying is that it is possible to live longer than your time. And it is also possible to die before your time. In Ecclesiastes 7 verse 17, we read that, Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why should you die before your time? That if you are wicked and foolish, you can die before your time. It pains my heart to see young people who are dead in their graves because they have been foolishly involved in drugs, alcohol, gangs, and crime. The Bible also gives examples of people who died before their time. We read in the Bible about Judas. Judas sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver and went out and hanged himself. I want to suggest that Judas died before his time. The second group that the Bible talks about who died before the time was Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Ghost and they died before their time. We know there are certain accidents and tragedies, calamities, such as car accidents, plane crash, terrorist attacks, floods, and so forth. Those ones you have no control over. But it is possible to die before your time. But I want to tell you that we make daily choices that determine how long we live and how long, how well we live. God has given us power of choice. We can literally choose between extended life and premature death. If you die, you know some people die, that if you die, you will go to heaven. So there's no need of hanging around here. You can as well stop eating, stop drinking, stop going to a doctor, get sick and die. But if when you die we go to heaven, we can as well take poison and go to heaven. But you know that this is a lie. When you die, you don't go to heaven. You have to mark time in the grave. So instead of going to mark time in the grave, brothers and sisters, let me suggest that we better try to hang around here for as long as possible. Because Jesus might come and take us before we die. But we should not just hang around. We should, we should be in good shape. We should have a good quality of life. But what, that will depend on the choices that we make. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, he shall reap. The choices that we make, we reap what we sow. The Bible says that there is a spiritual cause of death. In Romans 6, verse 12, 23, the wages of sin is death. And John 3, verse, 20, verse 4, it says the sin is the transgression of the, law of, God, of the law of God. Sin is the cause of spiritual death. But there's another cause of the spiritual death. That is spiritual death by people mistreating their bodies and not following the laws of health and dying prematurely. One of the commandments says that thou shalt not kill. But this does not mean just murdering some, no, does not mean just only murdering somebody else. Let me tell you that you can also be guilty of murdering yourself. You can be guilty of killing yourself. There are those who commit suicide by shooting or hanging themselves. But there are also those who commit suicide by what they drink and eat with their mouths. And God wants the best for us. That's why John says in the third epistle of John, verse one, chapter 1, verse 3, that beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. Be in health just as your soul prospers. God wants us to prosper. He, do, he does not want us to be poverty stricken. God wants us to be in good health. 
it is not use having wealth without health. Much of the wealth we have is in our health. You have seen the futility of having wealth, especially in these times, when those who are wealthy just leave their wealth there, and they would rather have health than wealth. The Lord wants us to prosper and be in good health. That's why John says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prosper. In Romans 12 verse 1, Paul writes that, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. We ought to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. It did not say, give him a dead sacrifice. It said a living sacrifice. It did not say, give him a dying sacrifice. It did not say, give him an unhealthy sacrifice. It says, give him a living sacrifice that is acceptable to God. God does not want us to come to him emaciated and out of health. He wants us to give our bodies as a living sacrifice. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 20, we read that, Or oh, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Spirit of God, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? That's why the, John writes, Fear God and give glory to, unto him. We glorify God, brothers and sisters, because our body is the temple of, God, of the Holy Ghost. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We did not just evolve from apes and monkeys. The children have told us in the, the beginner's class that we were created by God, fearfully and wonderfully made. And uh, we did that in the book of Psalms. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalms 139 verse 14. We have systems within, our, within us working together to keep us alive. We have the digestive system, circulatory system, nervous system, and muscular system. You know, our brain is a study in itself. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you do not have to turn your heart on. It beats automatically. You do not have to turn your brain on. Because if you are to turn our brain on, some of us may forget. <laughs> our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, our bodies heal themselves. You do not get cut and just watch. If you get cut, you will see the body healing itself. There are no spare parts for our body. I know there are issues like organ transplant, but you do not want to be in a situation where you are waiting for a liver, or you are waiting for a lung, or waiting for a heart. You better keep the one that you have got and keep it in good shape. We must follow the Bible and what it says about taking care of our health and taking care of our bodies. In fact, some people take care of their cars better than they do for their bodies. You know, when you buy a car, you get a manual which tells you what to do with it, when to change oil, when to keep it tuned, and a whole lot of things to keep the car in good condition. If you ignore, ignore the manual, you will have a lot of problems with your car. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the Bible is our health manual that God has given us for operation of our bodies. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 24, the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. God wants to preserve us alive if we will follow the word of God. If we ignore it, do what you want to do, eat what you want to eat, drink what you want to drink, you will find yourself in our operation room. And certainly, you might find yourself dead. There's a silent death that is going on today because people are ignoring our, their health. And therefore, uh, I want to pick three prescriptions that I want to give for a healthy life. You know, there are many medications for, every, for conditions, but for, uh, and even for every condition, you can pick the three most important. So I picked the three. The first prescription, the first item in the prescription say, drink right. The second item, avoid drugs and tobacco. The third one, eat right. So I'll 
expound on the first one. Drink right. You know, many people do not know what to drink. But I want to say God has given us the good old water. There's nothing better than water. Our bodies are made of a, up of a lot of water. The percentage of water in our brains is much more. Our problem is that we do not drink enough water. We do drink too much Coke. We drink too much tea. We drink too much other stuff when what we need to drink is water. And then God has given us fruit juice. But man has taken fruit juice, added yeast, and allowed it to ferment, making a lot of stuff that will make you high and take you low. I'm talking about gin, beer, wine, whiskey. All this will tear up your body. Alcohol even destroys your brain cells. I do not know. I know that I do not have many brain cells left, but I want to keep them. The Bible says alcohol is not good for you, those trying to preserve their health. You read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That if you are taking alcohol, you are not wise. The Bible says wine will mock you. It will cause you, your body to start raging. The Bible says that whoever is deceived is not wise. As a matter of fact, the Bible is very kind here. Very kind. Because if you are not wise, you are a fool. So, and that is what alcohol will make you to be. How alcohol will make you to be a plum fool. You can't walk right. You can't talk right. You can't think right. You can't act right. It messes up your body and your mind. Can you imagine a CEO of a company going to the, to the uh, vending machines Mistaking, mistaking it for a urinal and urinating there in broad daylight because of alcohol. When I was a medical student, one of my colleagues, when I was studying, I just saw some water flowing, some liquid flowing into my room. One of my colleagues had mistaken my door for a urinal because of alcohol. That's why the Bible says that if you are not taking alcohol, you are not wise. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 31, it says, do not look at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it whiles around smoothly. At last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. The Bible says that drinking alcohol is like getting bitten by a snake. I think it might even do better getting bitten by a snake. Because there are some things that you will do when you have taken alcohol which you cannot do when you are beaten by a snake. Alcohol is poison. A few ounces will kill a child. If you drink it on a continuous basis, it is killing you as well. Alcohol does all kinds of things. Drinking and driving. Thousands of people are killed by drunken drivers. You know, the last two years we have been on a lockdown. Many people not going to work. But can you imagine? the number of people who died last year because of drunk, drinking and drunk and driving is more than those who died before the lockdown. Can you imagine? People commit crimes because of they have been drinking. Families and homes are broken and destroyed because of alcohol. The Bible says it is the devil's brew and we ought to leave it alone. Let me tell you that there will be no wine in heaven. There will be no pubs in heaven. There will be no bars in heaven. And there will be no nightclubs in heaven. If you are doubting, we read what Paul writes in the book of Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 10. No thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no extortionists shall inherit the kingdom of God. There will be no thieves and drunkards in heaven. Corruption will not find its way in the golden streets. The other popular beverage that we take is coffee. Coffee contains a poison called caffeine. 
caffeine keeps your body blood pressure raised. Tea has got ta- caffeine and tannic acid. We are a nation of tea and coffee drunkards. You do not need any caffeine in your body. It is also found in Coca- Coca- Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. We need to make sure that we drink the right drink. The best drink, brothers and sisters, is water, and the other is the good old fruit juice. I want to say that we need to leave alcohol, coffee, and tea alone. The Bible also says, the second item, that we need to avoid drugs and tobacco. We have a terrible drug problem in Kenya. We have marijuana, cocaine, heroin. How many people have lost their lives because of using drugs? But there's another drug that people use that has been legalized by the government. The drug is called nicotine. It is found in cigarettes. You have heard a lot of, of what has been said about cigarettes. One may say that I only know what the government says about it. What does the Bible say about cigarettes? The Bible may not say something about smoking because people back then were not smokers. But I want to tell you that the Bible always has a principle that applies to the situation. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says that if any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Smoking defiles the body. It defiles the temple of God. In fact, smoking causes lung cancer, cancer of the esophagus, cancer of the larynx. In fact, if you check the first top 10 cancers in this country, 30% are caused by smoking. This, if there's anything you need to die to do in life is to breathe. You can do without water. You can do without food. But you cannot go on living without breathing. You can't. There are thousands of people dying throughout the world because of smoking-related cancers. Smoking will burn up your lungs and stop you from breathing. Many people have died prematurely because of lung cancers. The Bible says that if we defile our bodies, God will destroy us. There will be no smoking in heaven. The angels will not be walking around sweeping cigarette butts in heaven. There will be no cigarette products in heaven. In fact, if, even if you happen to chew tobacco in heaven, for you to spit it, you'll have to go out and spit it in hell. And there's no turning coming back. <laughs> the third and the final description here that I want us to look at is um, it says eat right what did I say you know for most people their appetite and their stomachs are their worst enemies one third of cancers are found in the digestive system let me tell you about the top 10 cancers in Kenya top 10 cancers number one is breast cancer cancer of the cervix cancer of the prostate. Then number four is the cancer of the esophagus in the digestive system. Number five, colorectal cancer, also in the digestive system. The stomach, cancer of the stomach. Then there are lymphomas, leukemia, cancer of the ovary, and cancer of the nasopharynx. Cancer of esophagus and nasopharynx and cancer of the lungs are associated with smoking. The association between smoking and lung cancer is as strong as the association between consumption of meat and cancer of the colon. The top five cancers in men in this country are prostate cancer, is cancer of the esophagus, colorectal cancer, Nardi-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and cancer of the stomach. So you find that out of the five top cancers in men in Kenya, three are from the digestive system. That's, and, and number one cancer in men 
is cancer of the prostate. That's why I want to suggest that above all men above 50 years should have annual direct rectal examination and PSA to screen for cancer of the prostate. This should begin at the age of 40 if there's a, a, family, a strong family history of cancer of the prostate. If you take the top five cancers in females, again, you find cancer of the breast, cancer of the cervix, cancer of the esophagus, gas, number three, colorectal cancer, number five, and cancer of the ovary is number five. All females should examine their breasts as often as they bathe. If you bathe 10 times, examine your breast 10 times and report any breast lump to your medical provider. And you should have annual breast exam examination as appropriate. Similarly, ladies need to have annual pap smear test because cancer of the breast is number one in ladies. Number two, cancer of the cervix, which can be detected early by pap smear. Those eligible for papilloma virus vaccination should also do so to prevent cancer of the cervix. You know, there's a, vac a vaccine that is given to prevent cancer of the cervix. And actually, most of the studies on this vaccine were done in Kenya. So, uh, there's no need for us to suffer from these cancers. God said, behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of tree yielding seed, to you it shall be food. The original diet for man was fruits, grains, and nuts. The tree of life had fruit only, fruit and grain and nuts later, and later God added vegetables. You will notice that meat was not part of man's original diet. God did not create us to be meat eaters. We are not to be created to be carnivorous. If you don't believe me, go to the animal orphanage tomorrow and compare your teeth and the teeth of a lion or a tiger. These animals, the teeth can tear meat. Can tear meat. We do not have teeth like that. God did not originally create us to eat meat. God only allowed man to eat meat after the flood. God told Noah to take animals that were clean into the ark by seven, but unclean by two. God knew that all the vegetation on earth will be destroyed by the flood, and that's why God allowed them to eat meat after the flood. But God made a distinction between clean and unclean. And even when God allowed men to eat meat, clean, clean meat, suddenly man's lifespan dropped. The people who lived before the floods did not eat meat. Their average lifespan was 900 years. 900 years. But when, but when uh, they were, but so when they were about 200 years, they were still youngsters. So if you had a youth uh, class that time, the average age was 200 years. At 400 years, they were just in the prime of their life. Their old age started at 800 years. In addition to not eating meat, they had clean water, no air pollution, but they also ate meatless diet. But when man started eating meat, his lifespan dropped. God did not just allow man to eat meat, but only for clean animals. Today, people will eat anything that will jump, anything that will skip, anything that runs, anything that crawls. In fact, there's an article in the Time magazine they call it a zoo plate. What was in this plate was roast caterpillar, barbecue Japanese snake, fried Japanese anthills, grasshoppers, honey bees, duck, squid, roast seals, quail eggs, you know, quail eggs are it's a, something that people like here, octopus, crocodile, and Mexican, Mexican worms. They were living good. I lived in a place called New Orleans in Louisiana. There's a staff there called Gambo. There's no knowing what is in this delicious meal, but it's just death in a plate. It contains crawfish as the main component. Crawfish. You know, there's a time the crow was taking his young ones for a, a, a walk on the beach. 
And they, uh, he told the, 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 the young ones that when I see dangerous animals, I'll warn you. So they saw a cow. The crow told the children, don't worry about that one. That one only eats grass. Don't bother with it. Then they saw a horse. Said, although it is big, but don't worry about it. Just make sure it doesn't step on you. But when they saw a human being, the crow advises young ones, disappear. This one eats anything that walks or crawls. <laughs> the tragic thing is that what God explicitly told man not to eat, he loves most. The pig, the pig, it is eaten from tail to head. There's nothing that is thrown from the pig. Bacon, sausage, spare ribs. You know, God did not envisage that we'll be eating crabs and so forth. But he talked about the pig. But man has exceeded the imagination of God. In Leviticus 11 verse 8, our, of their flesh ye shall not eat. They are unclean. God is talking about the pig. God made the pig to be a scavenger. A scavenger is an animal that eats waste of earth. You cannot make a scavenger clean. The reason why you have so much garbage on earth is because man is, is eating the scavengers. The Bible says the pig is unclean. I want to say that you cannot make pig clean. When you eat pig, you are eating cooked worms and parasites. The devil makes it to, be, to taste so good. Eating pig will mess up your body, put you in poor health, and send you to an early grave. In Isaiah chapter 6, 66, verse 17, the Bible says that they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine flesh and the abomination, the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. Some people eat mice. In some neighborhoods, there are no dogs. There are some places you cannot even keep a donkey. Some neighborhoods, you cannot even keep a cat. But the Bible says that you cannot just eat anything that is in the water also. You cannot just eat the scavengers in water. I want us to read together the book of Leviticus. Chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, All the creatures living in water of the seas and the streams, you may eat any that have fins and scales. But all creatures in the seas or streams that do not have fins and scales, whether among all the swarming things or among all the living creatures in the water, you are to regard as unclean. And since you are to regard them as unclean, you must not eat their meat. You must regard their carcasses as unclean. Anything living in water that does not have fins and scales is to be regarded as unclean by you. If you have to eat from water, they should have fins and scales. Shrimps do not have fins or scales. Lobsters, crabs, oysters, neither have neither fins nor scales. In fact, these are also scavengers. They are like rats. If you want to catch a shrimp or lobster, you, you go to where the filth of the ocean is found. The lobster is also called the rat of the sea. When somebody is drowned in the sea and you want to get, you go and get the body, you pull it, pull the dead bodies from water. Guess what you find eating them? The good old delicious shrimp. They are scavengers and the Bible says they are unclean. Fish with scales cannot be injected with poison by other animals. Fish with fins can swim out of polluted water. No wonder people are dying of all kinds of diseases. We are not eating the way God told us to eat. I want to say that if we were eating the way God has told us to eat, we would not even have had coronavirus. Amen? In heaven, I want to tell you again, there will be no meat in heaven. To eat meat, something ought to die. But in heaven, there shall be no more death. Not even animals are going to die in heaven. If you are planning to go to heaven, you better learn now how to eat fruits. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, in the middle of the streets, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, 
which 12 fruits each tree yielding is it every month. Fruit is a perfect food, high in potassium, high in vitamins, low in sodium. It will help us to live, to live. No wonder they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. There are many people, even in the Bible, who have been tempted by appetite. Adam and Eve were tempted by appetite. Daniel and his three Hebrew friends were tempted by appetite and they overcame. They determined not to defile their bodies. They were strong and wise. Even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was tempted by appetite. He was told, turn stones into bread and eat. And the Lord said in Matthew 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but the every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. The Lord who provided manna in the wilderness will take care of my needs if I'm faithful and true to him. Book of Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not their clean thing, and I will receive you. I want to conclude by saying that uh, don't uh, uh, leave this sanctuary thinking that I'm a saint. I also just want to be a good man. I find myself sometimes violating the intentions of my heart, but it is well that the ideals are in my heart. Because salvation is a journey, not a destination. In a journey you will stumble, fall, but keep on moving. It is well that you have it in your heart to keep on moving. Jesus suffered when he was tempted and is able to help those who are being tempted now. He was tempted and he became victorious. That's why the songwriter says, onward Christian soldiers marching us to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. I want to suggest, brothers and sisters, on this health day, that it is time for us to cross the temperance Jordan. The health ministry, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, has invested a lot of resources in the health ministry department to teach us these things. But it is of no use to keep on repeating without us crossing the temperance Jordan. Temperance means to turn around and renounce old life. It is time to throw away the alcohol bottle. I want to suggest that it's time to throw away cigarettes. God takes men and women, rest in sin, and changes this to new creatures. It is time to get rid of pork meats and other unclean meats. I know habits are hard to break, but you can live a temperate life because Jesus can help us. The Philippians 4, verse 3, 13, the apostle tells us that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And John 10 verse 10, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He that hath the Son hath life, and he hath not the Son of God hath not life. Hath not life. Jesus can change your habits. Amen? I want to tell you that Jesus can change your taste. If you are struggling with the coffee, Jesus can change your appetite. Jesus can change your life. And when he does, he will give you new strength. He will give you new vitality and give you a good quality of life. That's why he declares, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is our faithful brother. And he has gone through these things and he overcame. The story is told of an old sheep, an old rugged sheep, called uh, Bust Them Up. This sheep used to sail into a harbor, making so much noise because it was ragged and broken. It was like a, uh, a junk. You know how a junk car moves. Every time it came, people knew that Bust and Hub has come back. Then it disappeared for a while. Then another day, people at the harbor saw another sheep coming, but they did not recognize it. But when it, 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 it docked, it was the same sheep. It had been renovated. Then they were, they were asked, what has happened to this sheep? They told, the, they told them that it got a new captain. 
I want to suggest that Jesus is the captain of our salvation. If we have Jesus, he can change us. All we need in our lives is a new captain in our soul. He will help you to drink right, to eat right, and to live right. Amen? All you have to do is surrender to him and follow the light of his words. May God bless you.